Podcasts Radio Network proudly presents the Broadcasters Podcast. Here is the king of podcasts. Now, we're all talking about Lizzo basically being canceled now because a new lawsuit has come to light. We're going to talk about that on the program. But before I get that to that part, can we talk about the fact that this already happened to Lizzo? Cancel culture was coming for her at the start of the year. Do we remember that that happened? Okay. I want to take you back to January of this year because it was a song that came out and she made a comment about cancel culture being appropriation. Everybody might remember what that was, but let me go ahead and take this story. This was actually, it was a story I covered on my depraved to the botcher's program back in January of this year. So she went to social media to share her thoughts on cancel culture. And it was, some of it stirred up from last summer, 2022, when she put on a song called Girls, where she was under fire for using an ableist term in her song because she used the word spaz. And then she wrote on Twitter at the time, this may be a random time to, random time to say this, but it's on my heart. Cancel culture is appropriation. There was real outrage from truly marginalized people, and now it's become trendy, misused, and misdirected. I hope we can phase out of this focus and focus our outrage on the real problems. Well, you know, people can talk about some of her songs and what she talks about. You know, rumors. It feels like she was kind of predicting the future. And here we are. And now she's got caught up in something that is real problems because some of her dancers have called her out on some very bad behavior in her part. Very Ellen DeGeneres like, if you will. Anyway, I go back and I remember talking about this on the Praise and Debauchers. If you haven't heard of the show, you can find it on the website, kingofpodcasts.com. And I just remember I talked about it. I just figured I can play this quick clip. He made a statement afterwards after she changed it. But remember, this is where Tom Likas, radio host extraordinaire, and somebody else honestly follow when it comes to this advice. If you're going to be in, if you're going to be famous, you're going to be doing something in either radio, television, whatever you're going to do, whatever broadcasting you're doing, you don't need to be doing something you're going to have to apologize for later. You don't need to apologize. You shouldn't be doing anything where you have to apologize. Because then if you apologize, you're weakened. And that's what happened here with Lizzo. Somebody should have told her, listen, you're not going to win this war. So she changed the lyrics in her song. And then she went to Twitter to try to clarify. Let me make one thing clear. I never want to promote derogatory language as a fat black woman in America. I've had many hurtful words, words used against me. So I understand the power words can have, whether intentionally or in my case, unintentionally. I'll tell you, she can't help herself to have to defend herself. And she did it today again, because now we have a lawsuit. And see, when she talks about, you know, what she says people do to her when it comes to her body shaming, when it comes to her attitude and what she's uh, the person that she is. Well, now what we found out as projection, it sounds like, because now we're getting multiple allegations from her dancers as to her behavior. So here's what we got so far. I'm going to take it with the New York Times. So on Thursday, she's denying allegations made against her by three former dancers who said she created a hostile work environment while performing concerts during her special tour this year. And the three dancers said they had been, quote, exposed to an overtly sexual atmosphere that permeated their workplace. That's a lawsuit they filed Tuesday in in L.A. Superior Court. Describing several episodes in this lawsuit were that the lawyers for the dancers said amounted to sexual harassment and weight shaming. Now, we'll get into Lizzo's statement in a moment. But two of the plaintiffs, Ariana Davis and Krista Williams, became dancers for Lizzo after competing on her reality TV show on Amazon Prime, Watch Out for the Big Girls. And the lawsuit says that Davis and Williams were fired in the spring of 2023. A third plaintiff was hired in May 2021 to perform in Lizzo's Rumors music video, Noel Rodriguez, and joined the dance team. And she resigned shortly after Davis and Williams were fired. Now, Davis, who was diagnosed with a binge eating disorder, said in a lawsuit that some of Lizzo's statements to dancers gave her the impression that she had to explain her weight gain and disclose intimate personal details about her life in order to keep her job. And then she also talked about, in the the lawsuit, the dancers talked about an episode at a nightclub in Amsterdam 
Lizzo began inviting employees to touch nude performers and handle dildos and bananas used in their performances. And by the way, in that station in the Netherlands, she, or it's been answered in, right, in the Netherlands, in Holland, right? The deal was is that she talked about wanting to go to this place, talking to one of the radio DJs when she was there in town. And a dancer fearing retaliation acquiesced to touching the breast of a nude female performer despite repeatedly expressing no interest in doing so. Right. Bananas on the vag. That's what she wanted to see. Lizzo. And she got her dancers to participate in it. So the defendants used her full name, Lizzo's full name, Melissa Jefferson, instead of her stage name and her production company and the tourist dance captain. Now, the dance captain was accused of making expli- sexually explicit comments to the dancers and of engaging in religious harassment. Oof, this is not good. So this has gone on now in the last 48 hours. It's wild so far what we got so far. So Lizzo's responding back, as she's done before. When she had the issue of the ableist comment on her song, Girls, the cancel culture stuff that was being said to her about her body shaming, bitch, that's a compliment. Listen, I've talked about it on previous programs. This is not new to me. What can I say? She is a lightning rod to get herself into something that she has to go ahead and defend. She's done it a few times. She's made some comments. She's done some things that probably have not helped out. And this is culminating in something pretty bad. And people are really quickly after her now more than after because the facade this idea that she was nice and she had all these different good attributes about herself. Well, that's all going away. So now she's trying to double down and say, there's nothing here. So she missed you a response of this lawsuit. Here's what she said. Quote, these last few days have been gut wrenchingly difficult and overwhelmingly disappointing. My work ethic, morals and respectfulness have been questioned. My character has been criticized. She wrote this on her Instagram, by the way, where she normally does. If here, if not here, Twitter. Usually I choose not to respond to false allegations, but these are as unbelievable as they sound and too outrageous to not be addressed. These sensationalized stories are coming from former employees who have already publicly admitted that they were told their behavior on tour was inappropriate and unprofessional. As an artist, I've always been very passionate about what I do. I take my music and my performances seriously because at the end of the day, I only want, to, only want to put out the best art that represents me and my fans. With passion comes hard work, high standards, da 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 She ends her statement saying that she does not want to be received as a victim in the situation. She is quote-unquote not the villain. She also goes on to say, similar to the statement we, I just played for you before, quote, there is nothing more I take more seriously than the respect we deserve as women in the world. I know what it feels like to be body shamed on a daily basis. I would absolutely never criticize or terminate an employee because of their weight. I'm hurt, but I will not let the good work I've done in this world be overshadowed, overshadowed by this. So she put it out there and made her point. And then more of the talk was talking about this uh, word. Ariana Davis talked to CNN and says, was I pressured to touch a nude performer yes was i brought into a private meeting where i was kind of interrogated about my personal matters ended up having to share my very personal personal things about myself regarding my weight yes what i mean the list goes on we were were we pressured to do an excruciatingly long rehearsal that turned into a re-audition for the job that we already booked because apparently we weren't doing good enough yes that is true and then Rodriguez recounts a separate instance where Lizzo intended to physically assault her and doubled down on her statements in a CNN interview saying, quote, the facts of that were that she actually balled up her fist like this to me. And Rodriguez just demonstrates it. She started cracking her knuckles and she was like, you're so fucking lucky that basically I'm not going to hit you. And plaintiffs also alleged mistreatment from big girl uh, uh, BGBT, the company, right? that the management team was consisted entirely of white Europeans who often accused the black members of the dance team of being lazy, unprofessional and being, and having bad attitudes. And I guess the lawyer, uh, a Zambrano here, I, I can't find the name right off the bat, but I will look for that in a little bit. Oh, Ron Zambrano. Here we go. They were on CNN this morning. And he, he says 100% believes more people with claims against Lizzo and her production company will step forward in the coming days and pointed to the handful of people in Lizzo's circle who have already come out to support the former social, uh, former dancers on social media. One is Oscar nominee, Sophia Lali, Nali Allison, who revealed her 
on her social media pages that she exited her role as a director of a Lizzo documentary in 2019, only after two weeks because she was treated with such disrespect by Lizzo. Wow. Allison writes in her post, I traveled a bit with Lizzo to be the director of her documentary. I walked away and I was treated with such disrespect by her. I witnessed how arrogant and unkind she is. I was not protected and was thrown into a shitty situation with little support. My spirit said to run as fast as you fucking can, and I'm so grateful I trusted my gut. I felt ghastly and was deeply hurt, but I've healed. And so let's take more from the actual interview. Let's go ahead and play a little clip from CNN this morning. A lot of things that were going on, it took me a really long time to figure out that it was wrong. It took me actually until leaving the, the camp that I figured out that everything that w- went on was bad because I just chalked it up to, you know, oh, Lizzo might be a diva or, you know, this is just the industry. This is what we we go through. I mean, I, I, I think that I had inklings like I would be on the phone with my mom all day and and be like just complaining about the the disrespect and the the treatment and the the humiliation i mean me personally looking at um the response from lizzo was so disheartening because she was there she was there and to fix your hand to write on a piece of paper that you don't be- that you discredit everything we're saying is incredibly frustrating. So there's more to it, but that's Ariana Davis right there speaking on CNN this morning. Look, I look at the three girls here with the attorney. I feel bad for him. And the thing is, is that you're talking about three young plus size women. They're beautiful girls. And regardless if you feel like they, they weren't doing their job, they didn't deserve the treatment that they got either. Like for what they had to go and be subjected to, they're all in lockstep with this. Everybody's given the same story about the reputation and it goes against everything that Lizzo stands for. The kind of status, the kind of character she's created for herself. So yeah, Lizzo might be very talented. She is. She makes good songs. I like her songs. Hell, I like the song Pink and the Barbie soundtrack, but you know what? She's not a nice person and she probably never was. Or maybe Hollywood, or maybe just being in the music business, just, you know, stardom just really just changed her. And the thing is, it's contradictory altogether about the kind of treatment she gets herself. And then these girls are getting the exact same treatment. So it's Lizzo basically just projecting along. Okay, so the kind of abuse that she was given for as long as it's gone on. You know, when she wasn't famous, when she is famous, all the criticism she gets on social media. So she takes it out on her, on our, the people that are working for her that help her to further on along her career. This dance troupe that we're giving chances to only to take them down and dress them down too. And not just her, but her team as well. That's pretty fucked up. It's very fucked up. And so that is going to hurt her. And now she's stuck with this and who knows what comes up next for her. Like, this is like a complete fuck up. And now she's in a bad place and who knows what's going to happen now to figure all this. Now, Vanity Fair puts out her story and makes the point here about how Lizzo's basically being dethroned. This queen of pop, of current day pop. Ooh, boy. And, and people also took a lot to the fact of how... Beyonce in her concert, one of the songs that she puts out there where she mentions other female artists, she didn't give the name. So after these three dancers were making the points of what happened to them, another dancer, Courtney Hollingquest, uh, she clarifies she's not part of the lawsuit, but she voiced her support for those that sued. And then another one, the former creative director for Lizzo, Quinn Wilson, also echoed the sentiments. Quote, I haven't been a part of that world for around three years for a reason. And so the Break My Soul remix, Beyonce left Lizzo's name out of it. And at the same time, besides the sexual harassment, besides the body shaming, besides the, the complete disrespect, the other thing was being said here that this company, this production company did, they offered an unfair rate of 25% of full pay while they were on retainer and barred from seeking other dance work. 
Other performers were allegedly paid a 50% rate for such a setup. And then the spring management to agree to a 50% retainer, but then the relationship with the dancers was very strained. The dancers, the lawsuit alleges, were exposed to an overly sexual atmosphere that permeated their workplace. Now, let's get more into the actual thing in Amsterdam, because this is in the lawsuit. It says, it reads, while at Bananen Bar, things quickly got a hand, out of hand. She began inviting cast members to take turns touching new performers, catching dildos launched from the performer's vaginas, and eating bananas protruding from the performer's vaginas. So, the fuck? You're eating bananas from a girl's vagina. You don't know if that girl is clean or not. Okay, let's just make it like that. And they're not consensually part of these women, what they want to do with them. No. So it's a strip club, basically. And Lizzo wants them to go and do stuff in the strip clubs that she wouldn't do herself. Because it sounds like she, Lizzo didn't even do any of this, right? So Lizzo turned her attention to Ariana Davis and began pressuring her to touch the breast of one of the women performing at the club and began a chant leading her and said Ariana's name three times for, loud enough for all to hear, I'm good. And she did not want to touch. Not good at all. So she put it on herself, made a mistake. What do you do now? Like, what does she do to kind of, you know, come back up from this? I don't know. But this has hurt herself. But it's also the ongoing subject of cancel culture. What is it about these artists that, you know, in, in music now, you have certain artists that have just gotten really caught up into some things and just the fact that one of you and just abuse the people around them. I mean, it's normal about this, but this is something specific because of the fact it's body shaming. It's totally against the message, the message that Lizzo's been putting out there for a long time. And for the fact that she constantly would defend herself, but then take it out on her dancers. Like I could go ahead and go line and sinker with a multiple times where she also tried to defend herself and make her point. I'll play another clip from my show for the praise of Nabatris about what she kept going on when it comes to cancel culture. In this story here, they say that there were supporters that applauded the message with many online calling for more accountability for wrongdoing rather than using the word cancel to avoid actual consequences. And they take a lot of different people that were made comments about this. Okay. And by the way, she was at the People's Choice Awards and used her speech to amplify marginalized voices of these of 17 activists. Continues along. Listen, she's always going to be out there being talked about. And like I said, everybody started getting on top of her because she decided to go out and do some cosplay. So she's filling the way of water. It's, you know, we're just in time for the Avatar movie that came out uh, over the Christmas weekend. So, was it on Monday... She was wading through picturesque blue water in an all-black bikini, mimicking one of Avatar, the Way of Water's new characters, Sireya of the Metkayina clan. And she did a duet with herself, mimicking the movement side by side, flicking her hair in unison with the character. And she said, quote, Yes, I saved this video, uploaded it private, then duetted myself. And she captioned a post with a smiling emoji. And fans in the comments loved the cosplay moment and wrote in her comments, so she got her fan base to just eat it all up. Good for her. That's what she wanted to do. But of course, other people can see it. And they were making comments. On January 6th, on TikTok, she vented and said, quote, I've seen comments go from, oh my gosh, I liked you when you were thick. When did you, why did you lose weight? Oh my gosh, why did you get a BBL? I liked your body before. Oh my gosh, you're so big, you need to lose weight, but for your health, too. Oh my gosh, you're so little, you need to get ass or titties or something. Oh my gosh, why did she get all that work done? It's just too much work. Right. She says, are we okay? Do you see the delusion? Do you realize that artists are not here to fit your beauty standards? Artists are here to make art, and this body is art. I'm going to do whatever I want with this body. I wish that comments costed y'all money so we can see how much time we are fucking wasting on the wrong thing. Can we have this shit back there, please? See how she's talking here, okay? She couldn't have this kind of defense for the people working around her. So it's only about her she gets to go and protect herself. But yet, anybody else working around her can be shit on on a regular basis. I wanted to point out the contradiction, okay? Because everybody wants to talk about the current story, which is fine, but we need to go ahead and say that, look, Lizzo's had a track record of talking. It's coming back to bite her now. 
which makes what is being accused here by more than three girls, uh, several more that are coming out now, talking about this, makes it worse. So all that good-natured commentary, okay, being the girl boss, being the girl that's trying to be, you know, a beacon of body positivity, you just destroyed it. And there are a lot of girls, those fans right there that were building you up, that looked up to you, you've betrayed them. It's one thing to, you know, not care and make your money and all this shit. Okay. You can be Doja Cat right now who doesn't give a fuck about what's going on. Okay. She's putting out attention and she has her record coming out and you know, she doesn't wear wigs anymore. She don't want to do anything else anymore. She just doesn't give a shit anymore. She's just bashing her fans and doesn't care. Right. But Lizzo, you know, this is the sanctimonious hypocritical shit when you thought, okay, I can go and just bring this message of hope and enlightenment and positivity and, you know, calling out cancel culture. Well, the cancel culture is coming at you because you did something really bad and you allowed this perpetuated this to happen. You're a star. Okay. You didn't have to have your dance captain talk like she did to those people. You didn't have to have the management team constantly bashing the people there. Okay. You gave these girls a platform, which was all this positivity, the Amazon prime show, and you were recruiting them in with this damn TV show. So you exposed them. Okay. You marketed them. You used them. And not only did you use them, you get them on tour. You're paying them meager. You're not paying them full, full, full rate. And then you're making them do shit they don't want to do. Now, okay, Lizzo didn't make them actually physically do it. She just goaded them on, but it doesn't make it any better. Okay. She didn't make the girls. She didn't force the girls to absolutely eat the bananas out of the girls' vaginas. She did instruct them to put their hands on the nude girls, the nude performers. She might not have physically put her hands and made them put them on the breasts or the vajayjay. But she used her stardom. She used her power. She manipulated. And she's got a narcissistic ego to herself. And these girls all got hurt as a result of it. Is that a good thing? I mean, no one wants to condone what Lizzo's message was good. But how do you expect to go ahead and live up to that message now when you know, you're doing behavior that completely discredits everything that you even said in public. This public persona you created is ruined. And she's doubling down. She think Lizzo honestly thinks she's going to be able to get through all this. What's going to happen is cancel culture will do just like it's always done, if it's done right. But this is the cancel culture that does need to happen. This kind of behavior does not need to happen, Okay. So if there's enough girls out there that are going to talk about this, and by the way, these are not the kind of girls that, you know, like every day, like Hollywood would, eat, would bring you to a casting couch and sexually harass. Okay, this is not men harassing. This is women sexually harassing women and not just women. These are not models. They're young, they're beautiful, but they're plus size. They are bigger girls to fit the narrative, to fit the role of Lizzo. It's bad altogether. Like just the fact that Lizzo wants to create a dance troupe of all plus size girls. No, why don't you just bring the girls that want to bring on? And by the way, if they're big, if they're bigger girls, go for it. But does that have to be all of them that way? And Lizzo's also almost like doing this because of the fact that she wants to be able to go and say, okay, well, I'm getting girls that are inferior to me. Like I'm still going to be the most beautiful of the big girls out there and all these other minions below me, I can treat like shit, which is what she did. I'm going to believe the girls over Lizzo and her track record, her commentary over the last couple of years says it. Do you understand? It says that it's what she's done. So as like I said, we also talked about a story where she got lips over some TikTok trolls and she'll handle it. But then part of the problem is that, you know, she 
can handle the abuse. So she thinks that the girls that are working for her can also handle the abuse too. The abuse too. So we're playing a few more clips about Lizzo because I have the I have the uh, the commentary and I've done it already. So there was a point where Lizzo was on TikTok calling onto her detractors. This is from when I'm not podcasting, June tenth, twenty twenty. Yo, so every time there is a big girl on this app, I find that people always put my name in the comments. And to the people who be putting my name in the comments, thank you. Because you know what? If every time you see a big girl on this app loving on herself and putting herself out there and being confident and loving her body, you think of me or you think she looks like me, bitch, that is a what compliment. That means I'm out here doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Letting you bitches know the next time you try to make fun of a woman for her body or her size, that bitch, we're out here and we don't give a fuck and we're confident and we're bad bitches and we're cover stars. And yeah, we get the motherfucking views, the likes and the motherfucking clicks because we it. Shit, bitch. Okay, listen to what she said right there. I mean, the point is these dancers... These accusers right now that file a lawsuit, okay, they put themselves out there to be exposed to the world, okay, this is not an easy for easy for any of them to go ahead and come out and notice and be said anything, right? But this is also the Me Too movement. It's the thing, will women be able to go ahead and talk about this? Hey, and sexual harassment goes both ways, and it can go into a situation like this too. So girls that are always marginalized anyway, and this young lady, Lizzo, has been out there saying that she is representing big girls out there. Look at what she said. Listen to what she said. And now we see that this is all a lie. There's no way. I don't think it's even possible that this is all being said right here and it's all bullshit. I don't think so. I don't expect it to be. And nobody else does either. There's enough response out there I've seen from everybody out there on Instagram, TikTok, or whatever, or Twitter, or X now, right? X. And I'll tell you, no one's defending Lizzo. This is indefensible. She's been called out. And now she's got this mistake. And you know what? For all the work she's done to build up this reputation, to build herself up, her career could be ruined right now. And it will be her words that will be to her detriment, to her downfall. Isn't that a shame? There's not much more to be said about that. So I wanted to play all that out there. Point my point. It's nice when I have all the footage and I can bring the receipts, which I just did. What she said in her own voice. Now, we have to wait and see what happens when it comes to all these allegations when they come to light when the lawsuit goes into play and do we see a settlement come out of this there's a lot of things that could happen but lizzo will not apologize i think she's probably thinking or her management think probably thinks we could probably blow through this we could probably make it through this here mostly unscathed you know it's like Travis Scott. You know, he had all that criticism and all that stuff that happened to him. Maybe he'll make his way through here. If Travis Scott survived Astroworld, maybe Lizzo's going to survive this. And that's what they're probably thinking. They put so much into her right here. And you know what it is, too? I'll tell you like this. So, what, 2018 was when I first started hearing Lizzo's music. I heard Juice for the first time on the UK official chart, BBC Radio 1. And I remember hearing her the songs there. And then Truth Hurts became the breakout, number one song across the board, all over the world. And ever since, you know, she's been a pop star that has been all through the lexicon, right? And she's got a lot of songs out there, had her albums, and she's done very well for herself. So maybe there's something about Lizzo that maybe says, you know, maybe she's not going to be around. But like, we've already, the people that run her career, they probably think, well, you know what? Maybe that we don't need to worry about her anymore, that her star power is done. Like she's fading. Like, you know, we can't make much more off of her already. She's 35 years old, you know, 
And I'll take a story from Vox that talks about this, that she's built her brand on both body, body positivity and empowering upbeat hits. And so it's all done here, man. I don't know what you do next and what comes up now. <clears throat> now, Vox actually talked to a Chicago Kent employment law professor, Nicole Porter. She talked about that when it comes to the lawsuit, all the causes of action have some merit and some, some chance of succeeding. In my opinion, the strongest cause of action is the sexual harassment charge. It's likely a reasonable person that would think the behavior created a hostile work environment. She noted one possible defense could center on how much disclosure the plaintiffs had about the experiences they should expect to encounter in this role. Another part concerns about how Ariana Davis' struggles on tour and in the lawsuit, they make the point and say that it underscores the poor working conditions of the music industry and the lack of accountability that exists for such abuses. Long hours, difficult physical labor, short-term contracts are common, but where institutional oversight of an individual artist isn't always present. And now there has been precedent. Cher and Britney Spears have been sued by their employees in the past for alleged discrimination and battery, respectively. Cher's case was dismissed. Spears settled her case. And Martha Davis, a law professor at Northeastern University, says that the sort of workplace described by the plaintiffs lends itself to harassment and exploitation. There were not clear lines between employees' own time and their jobs while on the tour. And in this story from Vox, they make the point and say that there's a need for stars to be held responsible for bad behavior and the disparities that continue to exist on that front. Lizzo should face the legal process and potential consequences for any harm she's caused, but she's also likely to get more blowback for such a lawsuit. Unlike a Johnny Depp or Brad Pitt, both whom fielded allegations of abuse and denied them due to the sexism, racism, and fat phobia she has to deal with. But that's the part that Lizzo can think she can play with right now because she's marginalized already for a number of reasons. And she thinks that because she's been marginalized herself, that this is just adding on to it. And that's probably what Lizzo's going to try to use for herself in the court of public opinion in the first place. That's what she thinks she can do. We're going to leave that story there. We'll keep an eye on this and see what happens next, but that's not good for her. A lot of issues right there. Right now, I want to go ahead and move along into the strike. We still got to talk about it. There's a couple of things that happened here that made some difference. We should go ahead and bring up now. So one of the stories came out from SAG after is that there've been some interim agreements that have come under the spotlight. So some things that have been able to go and continue while the strike is going on. So let's go and go to what has been able to go on. 123 interim agreements have been handed out in both film and TV since the guild strike began projects from truly independent producers that have signed to abide by the laws, the terms of the new contract SAG after is pushing with studios and streamers. And there are some pros and cons behind it. Proponents argue that interim agreements are a lifeline for industry workers, including crew and others, when it's uh, many are potentially facing devastating financial insecurity. And these are the movies we're going to be seeing when we're waiting for the big movies or, or when SAG actors be able to get back on board. Movies like we're going to see here. They're going to be out there in the meantime, so at least we have something to watch coming up. Roxwell Films. They're producing right now a movie in Texas, Tulsa, Oklahoma, excuse me, a crime thriller called King Ivory. And this low-budget movie stars Ben Foster, Michael Mando, and Melissa Leo. They employ a solid 100 people, including SAG after actors and stunt persons. And production has had a ripple effect that will help local businesses, including hotels, food services, and other film-related providers. There's another movie, Armadilla, an ultra-low-budget indie film written and directed by Leighton Matthews, also got an agreement. There's an infrastructure that's being hurt by the dual strikes of SAG after and the WGA. The people that rent locations, the people that rent gear, it's a whole plethora, dozens of industries. They're affected by this, and this is a way they can keep working. And Matthews and Layton, effectively, they said that 
Their SAG after has been very effective as far as the administration of these agreements, for the most part, communicating quite clearly and getting them out to filmmakers in need with a sense of urgency. Union was understanding and helpful and awarded them the agreements within 48 hours. But there are some agreements that people are saying, why are they being allowed? So some of the the selection process and the projects are being picked up from someone like Amazon. There's a Viola, Dav- Viola Davis fronted G20, Apple TV Plus's Tehran, The Watchers, which is being a uh, deal with Warner Brothers Discovery's new line. They've all been awarded interim agreements. Producers have called for clarity on whether negative pickups make a difference. And another producer tells Deadline.com that it's hard to understand why projects from struck companies like Amazon and Apple have been awarded interim agreements. This producer says, quote, I think it models things to the point where I see why people are will be hesitant or go against them. I know that deals are very complicated. I also think maybe the fear is just you go shoot a movie, and by the time the movie's finished, there will obviously be a new deal in place. Some people are worried that a year later when the movie's finished, it'll just be a negative pickup, and the interim agreement doesn't really count anymore because whatever they've agreed on takes the place of that agreement. So that's one thing that's kind of been a snag out there. But it's nice to know there's some content that's still being created in the meantime. Meanwhile, there's still more that's going on right now talking about are the talks going to be happening? Like one of the issues we heard about, and I actually did a TikTok video about this. I haven't done one in a long time, where there was some talk that SAC after might get to go back to the negotiating table instead of the Writers Guild. I explained this on the Broadcasters podcast several weeks ago because of packaging or franchising and how the Writers Guild, they got that big win in 2019 over the Association of Talent Agents. And now that they're up with this deal with the, the AMPTP, the Writers Guild is being punished for this, for the fact that the Alliance of Motion Picture and TV Producers, they'll go ahead and negotiate with the Directors Guild and get their deal in place. Nothing new, but they're also going to go ahead and get to the, the actors and get their deal done before the Writers Guild. So the Writers Guild being neglected now up to 100 days again. We're going up to that magic number. They don't care. So the Writers Guild told members that studios may not be serious about restarting talks to make a deal. So the union sent a cautionary message about the studio's playbook and our only playbook is getting people back to work. So there's a planned Friday meeting between leaders of the, for the Writers Guild and AMPTP, the first since the May 2nd strike was called. AMPTP President Carol Lombardini requested a meeting with the union to discuss negotiations, and the Writers Guild told their members on Tuesday. But the Writers Guild is still going to the gathering with caution. And they said, quote, we challenged the studios and AMPTP to come to the meeting. They called for this Friday with a new playbook. Be willing to make a fair deal and begin to repair the damage of your strikes and your business practices have called the workers in this industry. Until then, our fellow writers, we will see you on the lines. So the writer strike, as of the story now, has lasted what? 97 days or 96 days, right? Or 97 as this show comes out. The Hollywood Reporter reported on Wednesday that writers, including former WGA leaders, initially agreed to the news the APTP and the union would meet on Friday with cautious optimism. And a former Writers Guild West president, Howard Rodman, says, quote, one hope is that the AMPTP may at long last grasp that the cost of negotiating a fair deal is less than quite, less, less than the cost of an ongoing strike. But it's a single and very preliminary step. Well, at least we have that to look forward to. At least we get them at the negotiating table again. But are we going to get anything out of this where we'll see the writers go say, hey, we're making progress. We're going to keep negotiating. Like if they're at the table and they both step away from the table again and continue the strike, there's a problem. But let's see if the MPTP, they've let this get to the 100, basically the 100 day mark once again, like it was in 2007. We're back here again. Certain things have already started to hit already. So let's see what happens now. The rap actually talked about the story and they made a point of about 
that the Friday this meeting is going to be happening. The rap, rap, the, the rap.com actually reported that the heads of various studios have recently met to talk about plans about returning to the negotiating table. And insiders on both sides of the labor dispute told the rap.com that lawyers and representatives have had back channel talks about a possible meeting, similar to how diplomats of different countries have informal talks to grease the wheels for a meeting between heads of state. Now, just to reiterate what the Writers Guild is worrying about besides AI and besides streaming residuals, one of the issues they're very much concerned about that they want to make sure will actually happen is studios, particularly streaming first ones like Netflix, have heavily pushed the use of mini rooms to hire writers to write scripts prior to a show being green lit and then only keeping one or two of those writers at most employed with a showrunner during production. That is a sticking point only for the Writers Guild, but a very important sticking point um, nevertheless. But the fact that there's even a talk about resuming talks in early August, even if it's unclear whether there is true movement on writers' room terms or other sticking points, several Guild members told the rap.com over the past few weeks they've been marching on the picket lines under the belief they would have to do, do so for several more weeks, if not months before talks would resume in any form. Either which way, this needs to happen. We've already had enough time for this right now, and the actors have already been out there for a couple of weeks, and everybody has to come to the table now. We have to finish this. This has to be resolved. It's going to look really bad if this waits till October, November, into the holiday season. This just has to get resolved. The points have been made. It's pretty clear what needs to be done. AMPTP actually responded back to this story and made the point that this, the ending of the strike is their only playbook. They said in the AMPTP in a statement that this strike has hurt thousands of people in this industry. We take that very seriously. Our only playbook is getting people back to work. So at least we're moving somewhere now in this story. That is good. And another story in the strike talk is the issue over the creators. So there's a story from variety.com that talks about this, where influencers, they've been able to join SAG actors since 2021. That creators now face a challenging predicament as they find themselves torn between a need or interest in earning money today and their potential future in the union as actors taking on Hollywood roles. We've talked about this last week pretty extensively. So supporting the union's goals are important, but the aggressive stance for SAG after poses a catch-22 for creators. If they accept promotional work with studios, they can lose out on future Hollywood roles. If they don't accept the work, they lose out on immediate, sometimes significant earnings. Now, influencers are getting reported getting tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars to generate content around new film releases. Smaller influencers might dream of being actors or writers, but now they're likely to rely on brand deals or sponsorships. And there's fear and uncertainty that opportunities to officially promote struck studio projects will hinder those chances. Confusion, risk, and paralysis also exist for, creator, exist for creators who make content related to struck company projects and but not directly paid for by struck companies. So a number of creators make reviews, coverage, or parodies of film or TV content distributed on YouTube or TikTok. The content is monetized through other means, including platforms, established ad, re ad revenue shares. The Guild hasn't provided guidelines on how they should operate or whether this content should disqualify a creator from future representation. Creators need to clarify more to understand the broader implications of the normal business activities in which they engage. Many influencers who negotiate inbound brand opportunities have little understanding of the current imbroglio between unions and the major media players, nor will they be made aware of how it will affect them by the studio network or agency contacting for the work. Bottom line is, this is where, even with the fact it's not just the Hollywood circle, of people that are all surrounding this. Remember, we already have the other fringe companies or the other outliers that also work for things for Hollywood contractually that are also being hurt by this. But the creators are also torn apart. There's a lot more than just Hollywood at stake here. The creators are also being affected as well because they want to be able to work with Hollywood. 
So this is a good point. They actually make a point. So without further clarity, influencers seem positioned to become collateral damage. If a, a scenario of creators being too uncertain to work unfolds, there could be a downside for all parties. This catch-22 for influencers could turn into a lose-lose-lose situation. Influencers, influencers could lose its crucial income. Unions could lose potentially valuable future members. Entertainment companies could lose crucial marketing opportunities. So uh, Oliver Olivier de Foss actually put a good point about all this here. I like that. So I got one more story I want to bring up here before we wrap things up. And this is from Ross on Radio, RadioInsight.com. He puts out a good story here because there was a talk. We talked a little bit about this last week about how top 40 stations might now start considering to have country music be a part of the top of the top 40 or pop music lexicon. So all these hit music stations have other music to go ahead and play. So Sean Ross makes this point that I agree with. He talks about that listeners most wax nostalgic for when they consider the top 40 radio of their childhood. So now someone mentions every time, almost every Saturday night afternoon in the Twitter thread of that week's America top 40 rerun. So if you didn't know as a syndicated program, uh, various stations, which could be classic rock or classic hit stations, they will run the original Casey Kasem America top 40 countdowns from the seventies or the eighties. <coughs> And so various stations get to run a featured countdown from the time period. Okay. Say like if there's a show this week, they would run an episode that would be from August of a particular year between 1970, 1988. Actually, there's a YouTuber right now that has just started putting up America top 40 episodes in in full length, which is really great. They put it up now. It's uh, the guy's name is super nostalgia. I don't know where he's from, but he's putting up old episodes of America Top 40 full length as they were run on the radio previously. You know, they were it's one of these syndicated radio shows. Obviously, this person runs a, works for a radio station that they're running these shows back. And if it's not just Casey Kasem's Top 40 countdown, America Top 40, it was when America Top 40 was hosted by Shadow Stevens from 88 to 95. And I actually been listening to a couple of those countdowns and even after 1991 or November 91, when billboard and their hot 100 was completely changed or actually the America top 40 no longer used the billboard hot 100 as the official top 40 list. But that was the one thing that happened. Okay. When you had songs like, you know, let's talk about sex or me. So horny came into the countdowns and they were hitting the top 40. Then radio stations, said well we need to go ahead and start homogenizing we can't let these certain rap songs make it into the mainstream so we need to go ahead and not play what the top 40 songs are which if you saw you see right now the Bilber hot 100 these days is full of songs that are either reggaeton or country or regional mexican or pop or rap or country or whatever like there's a various plethora of songs up there as a, as a matter of fact the top three songs in the top 100 this week are all country songs that you would never hear on a pop station. Maybe lo- maybe Fast Car by Luke Combs, but you would never hear Try That in a Small Town or Last Night. You wouldn't hear those songs. So Sean Ross talks to Dan Reed with WXPN in Philadelphia. It's one of those stations that's a, I think it's a, if I want to say, I believe it's one of those NPR stations. It's a station that is very enterprise. They're going back to where things were, where you play songs and a very different wide view. Now, Billboard's Elias Light talked about the play at all ethos was long gone from top 40, and that it's not there at this moment, particularly because there's been no pop rock making its way from alternative or active rock to top 40 recently. What people remember about the times of play at all is often having country and hip hop crossovers at the same time. At this moment, CHR can segue from Miguel to Morgan Wallen or from Luke Combs to Little Dirk. And even on a few stations, the little work and little Dirk and Wallen collaboration, collaboration, excuse me, but Taylor Swift is having to fill in a lot of space between them. As a lifetime listener, I'm usually happier. Sean Ross says when CHR is playing at all, I agree completely with him. I should get him on the show. I'm um, there's so much. I agree with him on when he says this. So there's fallout boys that just put out a version of, we didn't start the fire. It got up into the hot 100 at the very low end of the list and it dropped right off. 
is a record the top 40 needs to play a rock act again. And for some CHRs that already have it already from Love from the Other Side, and you'd like to see 30 Seconds of Mars stuck be a song that might get played in top 40. Now, while Sean Ross is correct about this, I will make this point. In the UK, in Europe, this is not the case. And one of the parts of the genre that he doesn't talk about is dance music. EDM is very pop friendly. Eurodance is extremely pop friendly. There are plenty of songs right now in that space that could be pop songs now in American radio. But for whatever reason, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago in the 2000s, dance music was allowed to be in the mainstream. But also, so was rock. Also, so was country. Also, so was hip hop. Something happened in the last decade, 15 years, that changed all that. Because now we don't have that anymore. We're more compartmentalized. We're more broken up than before. Top 40 was pretty much to rule throughout the early 80s, but it didn't do much to break the formats or slow rock radio's ascent. When they talk about WPGC in Washington, D.C., the fall of 1977, the station would play a wide range. Donna Summer, Fleetwood Mac, Sean Cassidy, Foghat, Ronnie Millsap, the Commodores and For- Foreigner. But the one song that was being really well at that point in 77 was the song that hit 10 weeks at number one, You Light Up My Life, an AC song. When Top 40 began its ascent in 82, 83, remember, when pop music wasn't as strong, other music would carry it up, would pick up the slack. In the early 80s, it was R&B. Country call servers were very much still present. In fall of 83, you remember in CHR, you might hear Islands in the Stream by Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton, number one song, followed by Come On, Feel the Noise by Quiet Riot, followed by Delirious by Prince. By 84, country crossovers were gone. Their bad absence barely noticed another great year for CHR. Then there was 97, 98, another consensus golden age of top 40, a definitely play at all moment. You had modern adult contemporary like Melissa Etheridge and Sheryl Crow with their first hits. Alternative dance, teen pop, a resurgence of R&B and hip-hop, and the return of country crossover. Songs like Leanne Rimes' How Do I Live? <clears throat> and there was another comeback in the late 2000s, the late aughts. During the turbo pop era, you could hear Lady Gaga or the artist known as Lady A or Antebellum. But much of Top 40's music was developed in-house. An Usher or Rihanna hit wouldn't be the single worked at r and Radio. Pop, punk apps like Cobra Starship or Boys Like Girls weren't spending a lot of time at alternative radio. And in 2010, the biggest pop rock record was Orianthes, according to you. And he makes a point that says that Turbo Pop was generally agreeable to everybody and CHR became an exporter of hits rather than an importer. CHR being self-contained only became a problem a few years ago when we got Turbo Pop to the second string and a segue to harder EDM and following the down tempo electronica with neither variety nor energy. More crossovers from other formats might have helped, but Top 40 had gotten out of practice of finding them. Yeah, we used to have a time where there would be like the British invasion. There would be artists that would come in from another area and take over. Let me tell you this too. Afrobeats right now should be a part of the Top 40 Lexicon. Like songs like Rima Calm Down. By the way, there's more of those. The Bianca People. Right now we got Taliban. Uh, Taliban's, and I forget the name of the artist. And there's others out there you could be playing right now that could absolutely fit in the space. Like right now, today's top hits does the play it all format. Billy Eilish to Gunna to Morgan Wallen. The true best moments for CHR have always been a combination of its own strong homegrown records and the best of everything. At this moment, with only four bulleted songs in the CHR Top 10, Top 40 is hobbled by the lack of both depth and variety. Labels not even wanting to work follow-ups with two number one hit songs and other formats like hip-hop, R&B, and alternative radio to fill the void. He's waiting for some label or indie or major to profit by showing the attention to radio that others are not. And only country with a larger body of healthier stations and a chart process informed by, but not solely dominated by streaming, has artists who can create their own streaming stories without being worked. Sean Ross Hatt makes a big point. Radio stations are missing the ball because they could go ahead and go back to this whole format. Like I said, it would be one thing 
if what Ryan Seacrest would play on America Top 40, the media-based list, which is the list that goes by what everybody else has to go and talk about, what everybody else has to apply to, and when there's not enough good songs in there or songs that have been there for so long that hit radio stations would go ahead and throw more throwbacks in than play more hits, well, there's a reason why. Because when you look at the list right now of songs, there's a lot that would not get played. And there's not a lot of there's not a lot of variety in there. And that's a big problem. That's the show for this week. I, I think we put a lot of good common ground in there, and I like that. Took an extra couple of minutes to talk about radio because I needed to get that in. Can't just sit here and not talk about radio. That was the like the owners of this program in the very beginning in the first place. So I'm glad we got that in. And that's the show for tonight. Everything you need to know about the show. I'm not even promoting Broadcasters Podcast anymore because you can find it in one space. One website you need to have all the time, and that is kingofpodcasts.com, just like it used to be. That's what you use right there. Kingofpodcasts.com, that is where you go to find everything about the show. And I hope you'll consider that and do that with yours truly. In the meantime, look at kingofpodcasts.com for everything. You can click on the logo look at past episodes there and then you can click on the logo to find all the past episodes of the program and then you can also find out where the show's found which is also apple Podcasts and spotify please rate review you can also find all my content on youtube as well and if you need to youtube link, you can go right to king of podcasts.com to find it there and also remember i'm all over social media x facebook instagram tiktok trends at king of podcasts until next week remember the content is king and the control of your content is in your hands